Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar which has been organized by the uh, Energy Oriented uh, Center of Excellence. So this is a European funded project that works on simulations and HPC. Um, today's webinar will be on parallel matrix free multigrid for extreme scale computing. During the talk, special attention will be given to the coarse grids of the multigrid hierarchy to avoid their becoming a sequential bottleneck. The talk will include a scalability study aiming to solve a linear system with more than 10 trillion unknowns. Today's speaker will be Dr. Uli Rude from Erlangen-Nürnberg University and Safax in Toulouse. The talk should be roughly 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Just so you know, for those of you who are using the GoToWebinar interface for the first time, uh, you as participants are all muted, but uh, using the GoToWebinar interface, you will have the opportunity to click on the Ask a Question button or on the Raise Hands button. So when we get to the Q&A session, please uh, click on uh, Ask a Question or Raise Your Hands, and I will open your mic so you can ask your question, and Professor Hude will answer. Um, the webinar itself is being recorded and will be made available on the ECO YouTube channel where you can find all our previous webinars as well. Uli, this is it for me. Please, you can go ahead. Yeah, Julian, thanks a lot for, for the introduction and for organizing this. So, uh, I'm the speaker. My name is Uli Rüde. Uh, just a double check, Julian, is my voice coming through clearly? Your voice is coming through clearly and we can see your screen. So everything is okay. in order. Well, uh, so thanks for your interest in uh, attending that seminar. So my uh, topic is multigrid methods. It's a field in which I have been working for most of my career. And you can see that the work is based on collaborations with uh, numerous people, including uh, groups in, in Munich and in Germany, with, which he, with whom we had a six-year project on exascale computing. It's my own group in, in Erlangen, which I'm heading there. And then it is uh, quite a number of people from uh, Surfax in Toulouse, where I have a second affiliation, where I'm leading the parallel algorithms team and collaborators there uh, also at, at IRIT in Toulouse, uh, who have especially contributed to this topic that was mentioned uh, improving the core spread solvers in, in multigrid. So let us uh, get started. I'm aiming to speak for something like uh, uh, yeah, 45 to 50 minutes. And what I have brought with me is first a few general remarks about the difficulties of exascale computing. So for specialists, this is maybe uh, just a summary or some uh, warm up, uh, these considerations. But then I will come to my topic, the algorithms and their efficiency, in particular our way to implement multigrid. Uh, it's geometric multigrid, not algebraic multigrid, with a software called hybrid, hierarchical hybrid grids and high tech. I will explain that. Uh, to study the efficiency, there is a paradigm called textbook multigrid efficiency. I hope to find some time to speak about that. Then I will talk about the topic. Uh, which is kind of an excursion of how we exploit these techniques for an ECHO project. So we have been working on uh, plasma fusion, so a sub-problem of that, I should make that disclaimer, that it's not full um, plasma fusion, but it is just this problem of the jury kinetic Poisson equation that we have worked on and are working on. Then this topic of coarse grid solvers and then as I've mentioned, we have the six-year project towards exascale computing, uh, and, and the largest computations that I can show uh, are actually coming from that. So this will be earth mantle convection. I'll say a few words about that. Some of you may also know my work on lattice Boltzmann methods. Therefore, the disclaimer, nothing about that in this talk. I can speak about that separately. So extreme scale computing, uh, that's 10 to the 18 flops. And in some ways, it is simple to think about that, because uh, we know that our processors are stuck at clock rates not too much higher than one gigahertz for energy consumption reasons and then uh, the, the heating of, of the chips. 
and that means that if you want to be, work on 10 to the 18 operations per second, you will have a degree of concurrency of 10 to the 9, because you need 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 9 to get 10 to the 18, and that can only be done through concurrency. And we sort of have a picture of what exascales machines may look like. They may have something like 10,000 nodes, and they may have something like 1,000 cores per node, and then maybe something through vectorization and pipelining, uh, another 10 to the 2 instructions in each core that are operated on concurrently. That's just very roughly. But what I'm the, the point that I want to make is that if you want to get to exascale, uh, there is nothing you have to lose. You have to exploit all of that. It's not enough to do MPI parallelism between the 10 to the 4 nodes. You also have to use some paradigm like shared memory parallel programming to deal with the 10 to the 3 cores. And then you have to get the code such that they vectorize and you can exploit that instruction level parallelism. And if you forget about one of them, uh, you will not reach exascale in the fullest sense. Um, also an interesting aspect, but for, for this talk only a side remark, um, if an energy consumption of, of a single flop is something like one nanojoule, uh, then again, if you multiply that uh, with uh, 10 to the 18 flops per second, you would get a machine that immediately needs a gigawatt, uh, one nanojoule uh, times 10 to the 18 multiplies up to a gigawatt. Uh, we do not want to build computers that consume a gigawatt, so energy is an issue. Um, and I probably don't talk, uh, I have also side aspects on uh, resilience, but not in this talk, so let's not go into that. Um, so this uh, hardware, configurations on, on this very abstract way already say, okay, what can we do about efficient solvers? It's essentially the algorithms that determine what cost we have, and then of course also the implementation. And uh, the core of scientific computing is typically uh, Gaussian elimination. So uh, there we know that the cost of the algorithm is two-thirds m cubed for a dense linear system with, with a standard solver. But uh, again, in the really large computation, it is typically not Gaussian elimination on dense systems that we are using. That's just the Lindbeck benchmark. What we typically want to solve is something like a PDE. And let's take uh, maybe the simplest and most notorious example of a PDE. That's the Poisson equation. And then very interestingly, uh, if I would now ask how many would know what is the best published algorithm how to solve Poisson's equation, uh, just as the prototype of an equation or any other one. And uh, typically people working in the field will have a portfolio of algorithms that they have been uh, hearing about or working on, wavelets, fast multipole methods, multigrid, any of them could be used uh, to solve uh, Poisson's equation. Of course, also Krylov methods as well, conjugate gradients, uh, GMRS, uh, which would not be uh, the, the latter ones would not be optimal in the sense that they scale linearly with the number of unknowns. Uh, the ones up here could, in principle, scale linearly. But even if you know that these algorithms are the ones that could scale linearly, which for large n is essential, uh, then what is the best constant published? And uh, it's I mean, pretty much amazing that uh, this is not a real research topic. And uh, the best that I know is a quite old paper, almost 40 years old by now, uh, that proposes for 2D Poisson an algorithm that goes with 30N. Uh, this is multigrid. Uh, to my knowledge, the, the fastest algorithm published. Um, but even with that knowledge, we, we have a, uh, a strange situation because if you'd say take a typical machine of today with a petaflop and maybe 100,000 uh, cores and then assume uh, that you want to solve a system now with n 10 to the 8, so 100 million unknowns, uh, the expected time to solution for that problem would be computed as something like 3 microseconds. And any one of you who has worked in linear solvers for PDEs knows that this is not what you typically observe with a state-of-the-art solver these days, that you can solve 100 million unknowns in uh, only microseconds. And this is not because this is a petascale machine with an exascale machine. It would get somewhat uh, faster even. You could do even bigger problems. But the problem is that we are missing that uh, 
theoretical prediction by several orders of magnitude. And there's this huge gap between what theory says, a relatively poorly researched part of theory, uh, but the theory is, is correct, and then what we observe in uh, computational practice. So what exascale computing is about, and from my point of view, is also to understand where is this gap, where is the optimality, how much, what fraction of optimality can we achieve. And optimality not just in the hardware sense and also not in the algorithmic sense, but bringing things together. This is what also this talk is about. So why is that prediction wrong and where do we stand? What can we do and where may be the next steps to get even that done? And uh, because I, I have been wondering about that uh, for quite some time, I would like to uh, bring up some of the issues that come up here in the, uh, a few years ago, uh, five and a half years ago now. I, I wrote in Cyan News and uh, yeah, editorial uh, th that make some of these points. And what I want to uh, indicate here is, well, optimal algorithms, are they always fast? Or what do you have to do to make them fast? And how do you balance the question of accuracy? Eventually, you likely don't want to solve a linear system, but if the PDE accuracy is essential. How does that uh, reflect in, in cost? Then the approximation order, that's of course influencing the complexity of your discrete system. How does that influence things? The mesh structure that you're using, um, I, I would assume that many people would think that unstructured meshes are more flexible, they give you a more modeling power versus structured meshes, but there is a performance penalty that you have to pay. Uh, you would have modern methods that are uh, using adaptive refinement that, however, might destroy superconvergence effects. Uh, not really very well studied how, how that is uh, balancing off. And then, of course, all the questions of efficiency on modern supercomputers and unstructured grids with maybe complicated data structures, how that is affecting that. Then the algebraic solver, I, I will talk a lot about operation count, but always one has to keep in mind how does that balance with parallel scalability? Uh, it could and it very often is the case that a slightly more expensive algorithm in terms of operation count has better scalability and therefore in the end wins. Uh, and uh, the cost metric, I've mentioned that energy consumption might be more critical than time to solution. Uh, then uh, maybe I don't talk about these things so much, uh, possibly the last one. Um, if you work in parallel, uh, you cannot always and, and you want to work efficiently, uh, determining the uh, associativity of operation that changes the round of error behavior. And therefore, uh, you may not get bitwise reproducibility of results, uh, in particular, if, if you're on a faulty system and have to build in fault tolerance measures, redo computations when some have failed. And that's also a big problem if you take the maybe naive approach that um, a computation is correct if you can repro reproduce this up to the last bit. Uh, that may not be so easy on, on the future systems. Okay, now um, after this warm up, bringing up a large number of topics, I want to immediately uh, jump into kind of the, the high end and then ask the question now with the linear systems and then taking PDEs such as Poisson's equation, later like we'll talk uh, more about Stokes maybe than ab about uh, Poisson, but let's take a look at that and ask what is the largest system? Where is the state of the art? And again, I can look back in this case, 15 years, uh, there's a paper by myself published in the supercomputing conference 2005. So it will be 16 years this year. And then we have uh, that algorithm, that, that article is titled, is 1.7 times 10 to the 10 unknown, the largest finite element that can be solved today, hoping that at supercomputing, anyone who has a larger system solved would appear and tell us. Um, that I think was standing at that time as the world record in linear system solving 16 years ago. And now 16 years later, where do we stand? Uh, now, 
I'm showing you a picture on a machine uh, close to actually where I'm currently sitting and where I'm giving that talk, uh, the SuperMOOC machine at LRZ in Garching. Um, if we come from the memory capacity, uh, this machine has roughly 700 terabytes of main memory, a uh, machine with a significant amount of memory. Um, and if you convert that into how many floating point numbers can you store, uh, you can store on that machine eight vectors of length 10 to the 13. So 10 trillion elements, if, if you accept trillion as 10 to the 12. And uh, now if a big topic of what I want to talk about is also matrix-free implementations. And if you now say we don't have to store the matrix, we find a clever way to avoid that, the eight vectors turn out to be enough to store enough information to solve a reasonable scientific finite element problem. And therefore, we can solve now systems with 10 to the 13, which would mean uh, that uh, since 2005, we've made progress by three orders of magnitude. If we were still on the scaling of uh, Moore's law, it should actually be more than that, a better improvement, but we see, especially in memory capacity, that uh, Moore's law is, is slowing down. And uh, yeah, of course, we use multigrid. I've already made that. And the um, other question, of course, is multigrid is known not to be so easily parallelizable. What do we have to do to get it scalable? And for those who have a linear algebra background, if you think of 10 to the 13 as being in, uh, the condition number of the system here goes with in, uh, like in to the two thirds. So the condition number is quite significantly high, even though it is just standard finite elements here. And uh, it's an interesting side question of what accuracy we can still expect. So here is uh, that scalability study uh, from a 2016 paper, also a few years already back, uh, not done on that machine, but one which in terms of memory was almost as big already, U Queen, uh, Eugene machine. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately not available anymore because especially for algorithmic work, scalability studies, this was a very good machine. And here is the scalability diagram. What you see is a, a weak scaling experiment. We start with five nodes. On the five nodes, we work on uh, 2.7 times 10 to the nine unknowns, so already uh, beyond uh, a billion unknowns on only five nodes of that machine. And then we increase the size of the system uh, from 2.7 by a factor of eight to 2.1 times 10 to the 10, so eight times more, another eight times more, another eight times more, and eventually we're up at 1.1 uh, times 10 to the 13 unknowns. Uh, that then uh, uses the, the larger share of the machine, so with a special permission to use um, essentially the whole machine for ourselves uh, with 300,000 threads, and what you then see, and that is the algorithmic miracle of multigrid, the number of iteration does not go up with the size of the system. The compute time only goes up moderately because of overheads, but in principle, it is uh, essentially stable. Uh, here, these two columns, time and time without coarse grid, is essentially that point that I've made. We see a slight uh, degradation here in the real compute time. But if you look at that time, if you take out the coarse grid, multigrid is perfectly scalable. So it is the uh, coarse grid, which at that time was not perfectly optimized, which has cost us a little bit of scalability that you see here. For practice, this would still be fine, but for a fundamental point of view, uh, one has to get rid of that non-scalability, if it's possible, that comes through the coarse grid. Okay. So we can do 10 to the 13, and uh, again, if anybody here knows bigger problems being solved in a weak scaling sense, then let me know. Uh, here is now how we do it. We do it with what we call hierarchical hybrid grids. Uh, so th this is already aiming at this application, what I show at the end. So the uh, earth mantle discretized with finite elements, starting with an icosahedron and then keeping refining and uh, modifying so that it uh, represents the sphere. You see one, two, three, four, five, that is behind here. I, I think it is 12 levels of refinement 
And uh, this finest mesh uh, zoomed in here uh, has then a mesh size of basically only one kilometer. Okay, um, so we use multi-grid and tetrahedral element shapes. We partition the domain, we parallelize everything on unstructured grids, and uh, we will talk about the coarse grids. But before we do that, I also want to emphasize that we need the matrix-free implementation. If you think about the storage that you would need to store the stiffness matrix or the mass matrix or both, then doing something of that size is uh, basically getting rid of the matrix uh, by the one order of magnitude in memory consumption. So you have to go for that if you want to go to that extreme scale. Um, multigrid, this is not a tutorial on, on multigrid, but for those uh, who just want to get a glimpse, what is the algorithmic structure of it? Uh, you have the finest grid and you solve essentially by doing something simple like relaxation on that grid, but then you transfer the problem to a coarser grid which goes by way of computing the residuals, so evaluating what is missing for the system to be solved, and then transferring that to a coarse grid. Here in that notation, little h means fine grid, big h means coarse grid, and typically the number of unknowns in 3D uh, reduces by a factor of eight by each level of recursion. And at the bottom, you have this problem that you then get a system that you still have to solve, and if it's another trivial problem, it is one problem that can still uh, cause you the non-scalability that you have seen in the previous slide. And uh, that's a uh, side or, or is essential uh, component that needs to be researched because it's uh, far from trivial how to do that in the best way. Okay, that's the algorithmic structure of multigrid. Um, there's a lot of debate or has been maybe in the community that these coarse grids uh, should be gotten rid of uh, because they, they create all this complexity. Uh, my point of view is, and, and we might debate that in the end, uh, in these PDEs that are of interest here and in the linear systems, you need to have a global data exchange. And, and the only way to get that exchange done in an efficient way is through our hierarchical structure, and multigrid is exactly the structure that you need. There is nothing better you can do uh, if you have them on the coarse grid idle processes while you solve for that, this is just how the world is. There is no way to avoid that if you want to solve these systems efficiently. So here are these uh, tetrahedral grids if they are refined. Uh, and the slide here indicates how we deal with the parallelization. So we have a macro element. So the big thing here is the macro element that is refined by several levels. They are distributed to different processes and in the uh, middle between, we have data structures that geometrically represent a face between the 3D elements and algorithmically represent the data structures and, and the algorithms that are needed to do the communication. Uh, we do that, by the way, also hierarchical. So we have the volumes, so the tets themselves, their faces, the edges, and the vertices in, in a very systematic setup of managing the data structures. And here you see how we do that for uh, the earth mantle. I think this is uh, illustrative to look at it, that uh, you can mesh something like the uh, spherical shell that is the earth mantle, so that rock layer, uh, 3,000 kilometers deep below our feet, rock before the iron core starts. And each of these tits are then uh, starting from an icosahedron uh, refined and then stretched to become the Spherical, uh, we, we use an algorithm for refining the tips that, to my knowledge, goes back to uh, Jürgen Bay. And then you see how these tips are then uh, being refined. That was briefly visible on that slide. An illustration now here only in 2D, because in 3D would be more complicated. It generalizes to uh, 3D, as you have seen. So these are the meshes that we have. We start with something unstructured, and then we add structured refinement in that particular way. Um, the current implementation has the code name HITECH for hybrid tetrahedral grids. Um, we want to do general uh, discretizations on these grids. The old prototype that I've showed before was restricted to simple discretizations. And we do that in what we believe an efficient way. Uh, as you can see here, 
the unknowns uh, here arranged as, as you might want to have them for P2 elements, uh, these here plus these here together, but maybe also volume uh, degrees of freedom are implemented in a systematic way, as I will show here on the next slide. So if you have all these unknowns, they are extracted and stored in a linearized form. So there are no pointer structures, no indirect addressing necessary if you do it in that form. And, and that is the advantage that we want to have because uh, this is the data structures which permit us to get uh, extra good instruction level parallelism. So these uh, last maybe two orders of magnitude that you can gain by having a code structure that permits vectorization and uh, instruction level parallelism. So you see uh, all the unknowns on the edges can be linearized and then you don't need um, any pointers anymore. If you think of the matrices, you're basically extracting substructures of the stiffness matrix that ha are banded. And, uh, and we do that in a systematic way directly from the grid generation. And similarly for, for the unknowns that are volume oriented, we do the same. So we have a set of these linear uh, unknowns stored in linearized areas with very fast index based access rather than indirect access with, um, with pointers. In 3D it gets quite complicated. And the benefit that we're getting out of that, we are now going down to study really the, the instruction level and node level uh, efficiency of our codes. So these diagrams are roofline diagrams. Uh, if, if you analyze in 3D what you have to do to perform a matrix vector multiplication or equivalent to here a Gauss-Seidel relaxation, uh, you get eight kernels, so it is basically eight traversals of the data structure. Uh, for, for the eight different types of unknowns that, that you have in this uh, particular setup. And in the roofline diagram, you see that all the kernels that we have are at the uh, supposed limit. So most of them are at the bandwidth limit in the roofline diagram. So they exhaust the bandwidth of the chip and could not be faster unless we would use some uh, temporal uh, blocking techniques, which, which here we don't. And uh, there's one kernel that like seems to lie outside here. That's actually the one that is responsible or that is caused by the, uh, that, that this is a Gauss-Seidel method. Gauss-Seidel is inherently sequential. And so it is here actually the scalar peak performance that determines where this point lies. It cannot uh, be faster than the scalar peak performance. Uh, so if you wanted to be better in that one, this is only uh, one of the eight kernels that in this sense underperforms, but inevitably because of that algorithm, we would have to change the algorithm to, to get rid of that. So this is node level up here. Uh, roof line analysis shows that not much better can be done unless the algorithm is changed. And then if uh, this is being put together to solve a linear system, this here uh, refers to Stokes uh, scaling up to 147,000 processes, uh, not quite 10 to the 13 unknowns, only a third of that, 3.6 times 10 to the 12 unknowns. Uh, you see that the timings for a multi grid algorithm are reasonably stable. Um, so the largest one out here with 10 to the 12 is not quite, so, so perfect would be if it were perfectly flat. Uh, when we go up from small problems to bigger problems, uh, the green, red, green, orange, and blue curve are different size of problems, but on the same kind of machine. So if, if you kind of go from blue uh, to orange to green, it's uh, a strong scaling scenario. And if you go along one of these curves, it's a weak scaling scenario. And you see that uh, we, we get uh, solution times in around 60 seconds, except this largest one, uh, where it's not completely clear why that is, uh, or it, it, it is quite, there's a reason behind it, uh, but not so easy to fix. You see that we are not using the full size of the processes there, which has to do with memory access problems. Anyway, uh, that's where we stand. I have to check my time. So I have spent roughly half of my time. So maybe I have to speed up a little bit. Um, Matrix-free methods, I said that this is very essential that we can work matrix-free. If we have 
a structured mesh with these kinds of elements, the 3D equivalent also, uh, then this is not enough to handle every geometry. If you think of the sphere, you want to do something like that to get the sphere. The downside of that is that uh, the stencils are then not constant anymore. We don't have to store any matrix if, uh, or only in a very limited form, if we have this kind of geometry and constant coefficients. But as soon as we have either variable coefficients or a deformed geometry and have to use blending to adapt to the geometry, the stencils are different from point to point. And uh, the technique, uh, I will elaborate on that on, on the next slide, is in fact to represent the matrix not by the classical finite element assembly, but by using a surrogate technique. And the surrogate is, you can show that in a geometry like this or like that, the uh, value of the matrix entries can be approximate with reasonable accuracy by cleverly designed polynomials. And evaluating these polynomials is much cheaper than doing the finite element assembly. And that is essential uh, to get an efficient on the fly recomputation of the matrix whenever you need the entries. So here is what I've just said. Uh, this is, by the way, how such a point in the 3D mesh looks. It's uh, connected to 50 neighbors for linear elements, as you see there. And each of these connections is represented in the matrix by a coefficient. And each of these coefficients can be approximated uh, by a polynomial. And uh, there's a trade-off, of course, involved in that. So uh, you first of all have, of course, to set up these surrogate polynomials. This has to be done in the setup phase. And uh, the, it is only an approximation, only in special cases, you can you get uh, perfect uh, uh, accuracy. And, and therefore, uh, we, we need to quantify, I think here it comes, how much we lose. So if the real operator is an L, the one that you get by the surrogate approximation has an error term in it where uh, the kind of the size on which you uh, set up these polynomials for us, this is typically that coarse grid size goes in and then the polynomial surrogate order. And then this is just the qualitative estimate and perturbation term, uh, which would be constant. So you have to make this big H to the Q plus one smaller than the finite element error that you have anyway uh, to make that technique uh, reasonable. And then I'll have some data on, on that in, on the next slides. Another thing that is worth mentioning, having found these surrogate polynomials is not everything. You still have to implement it efficiently. And that has to be done by carefully setting up a structure that you can evaluate these polynomials equivalently. So if you have an eighth order polynomial and have to evaluate that at every point, it might just be equally expensive as, as computing the stiffness matrix by numerical quadrature and whatever is in there. But it gets much cheaper if you evaluate it incrementally. That means while you traverse the grid, you just increment what changes from one point to the next. And then here's a set of papers if you're interested in that lays out uh, how, how this is developed and what the mathematics behind that is. What can be gained with that is shown here. Uh, this is an accuracy plot. So if the level of refinement goes, that means the mesh will, becomes finer, you would expect that the error goes down. And then the bottom line is kind of the classical finite element convergence that you see. And these lines that deviate and then stagnate are the ones that come from that surrogate technology. So if you use a surrogate with only moderate order, so here the boxes correspond here to fourth order, you're stagnating uh, roughly at the fourth level of refinement. So if you want to go to say the seventh level of refinement, uh, you have to go to this here, or maybe that is still good enough to one of these or so eighth or 10th order polynomials. So, you know, in, in some sense, you make your things worse because you add an additional error because if you use these surrogates, what is the benefit that you're getting? Well, it's a speed up that if you say, apply that on six levels of, of refinement, uh, then you see that the speed up that you're getting, this here is speed up uh, relative to the, uh, to the standard is almost uh, one order of magnitude, a factor of seven, eight or, or more, depending on how you set it up. 
So the speed up compared to a, a trivial or naive recomputation of the stiffness matrix is potentially a factor of 10, and so it is worthwhile to go for it. Okay, um, so here is that set together, and uh, of course there are further techniques. I, I think this technique has a, a lot of potential uh, interesting mathematics behind it, and it is by far not at its end. So what, what we are seeing, I think, is just the beginning of using these techniques. And I can point to, uh, you know, the, the, these diagrams is, are from a very recent work, uh, just submitted student paper for the student paper competition, Copper Mountain. So the Copper Mountain multigrid, the multigrid conference, maybe worldwide, uh, that happens this year online, of course, and that has a student paper competition. So that paper is submitted for the competition. Okay. Um, yeah, further things about efficiency. So far, you know, in, in the previous diagram, we've discussed that in an abstract form, and, and I've pointed out that we've gone through some efforts uh, to make uh, real parallelization and, and node level efficiency possible. Um, I would like to elaborate on that, both the abstract view and then the uh, machine oriented view, hardware oriented view. And I would like to put that in a context of. Uh, Brandt, one of the inventors, co-inventors of multigrid, and he coined that term textbook multigrid efficiency. It is a, a paradigm which I like a lot uh, because it is something very ambitious and certainly not easy to reach. So Brandt's claim, and in, in some sense you could say this is the holy grail of efficient PDE solvers, and especially multigrid, is that you solve a system with an efficiency that is not more expensive than 10 times applying the operator. So invert a matrix with a cost which is at most 10 times multiplying with the matrix. If you achieve that, you have done a good job. That's what textbook efficiency would then mean. And we will see where we stand in that. So first, uh, we'll do that in an abstract form by introducing what is a work unit. The work unit is a cost to apply something. A uh, work unit of A or a work unit is once applying the matrix A. One work unit is the work of applying A. That's how I have to say it. And in, in that notation, uh, textbook efficiency, TME, textbook multigrid efficiency, is achieved if the work of applying multigrid for a solution is relative to the cost of applying the matrix less than 10. Uh, note that this is defined with respect to the underlying differential equation and that this is much more ambitious than just mathematically claiming we have optimality or something like mesh independent convergence or, or one of the things that you see in, in many mathematical papers as, as their primary result. This is, I, I could even say a little bit provocatively, uh, if you achieve that, you're much closer to having something that's practical than if you have just an abstract mathematical proof of asymptotic optimality. And also TME requires that you know the constant, uh, so it is very difficult to assess theoretically. I don't know really much where this is done with mathematical rigor, but at least you can do it with systematic uh, numerical studies. Uh, this, what I show here is the so-called full multigrid variant, again for Poisson's equation, and full multigrid with a V-cycle Oops, I have a problem. I have to restart my slides because I had this pop-up window which was not blocked. Sorry for that. So the slide should be visible again. Um, They're back. So is it okay? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so, sorry for the hiccup. Uh, to explain that table, what does it mean? Uh, textbook multigrid efficiency also means that you're not solving your linear system with excessive accuracy. It means ideally you want to solve your linear system. The solution is called UL, twiggle as your solution, not as perfect. UL itself is what you would get with a perfect solution. No uh, remaining iteration error 
and you only do that up to u twiddle and the relation of the error of the u twiddle with respect to the perfectly linear sol solution is that factor gamma so in principle a factor of gamma of two means that you have twice as much error as your linear system would ideally provide as a solver as a, as, as a solution for a finite element problem so many people would probably say it should be a little bit less than two, uh, maybe uh, 10 or 20 percent more error than the finite element solution is, is acceptable. A factor of two would mean 100 percent more error. That's maybe uh, more than most people would want to tolerate. Now, these algorithms that we are trying out here, the full multigrid of the V-cycle of one pre-smoother and one post-smoother for a 3D Poisson equation, that's a very weak V cycle. It does not get tremendously good convergence. And full multigrid means that I'm recursively starting from a coarse grid and working myself upwards. Nevertheless, this algorithm reaches a gamma of four. That means it gives a reasonable accuracy, but it is 4.4 times as big as the discretization error itself. But say if we are now taking a V22 cycle, right, that means two smoothers in uh, the multigrid before coarsening and two after coming back, then this excess error is only a factor of 1.7, so it is 70%. If you want to get down to 10%, you have to do something like using two V cycles on every new level. So these are asymptotically optimal algorithms, and it shows that uh, you can, with very little effort, come to that uh, having a gamma of something like 1.2 or 1.3 or, or 1.7, depending on your perspective, each of them might be quite acceptable. So uh, that is what I wanted to say here. And say the this FMG V22, if you convert that now uh, to work units, it's 6.5 work units. So we have here achieved textbook multigrid efficiency at the cost of having solved the linear system only with an accuracy that increases the error by something like 70%. So it is uh, possible to reach textbook multigrid efficiency. So um, here is now uh, the same for, for Stokes. This is the Stokes equation, harder to solve because it's a saddle point system, not symmetric positive definite. Uh, this is discretized with a stabilization term um, because it's a P1, P1 discretization, which otherwise wouldn't be stable without the stabilization. Uh, here is the multigrid algorithm, and then here is the papers, how Stokes is being analyzed. Uh, this paper here uh, by Daniel Drischka and uh, our collaborators, Barbara Wolmuth, also Walter Zulehner from Linz, uh, ha have analyzed uh, this particular multigrid method with that smoother that has been developed here for efficiency reason. Um, yeah, and now comes a slide, which is again a little bit uh, difficult to explain, so I should take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, wh what we have done is the following. In this parameter space, how you design your multigrid method for the discretizations for Stokes. So P1, P1 with stabilization, and P2, P1, which is, naturally stable it's a taylor hood discretization uh, maybe the most yeah, uh, classical one classical stable discretization for for the stokes equation um, we have analyzed the cost and, and the a part is the, the momentum part of the stokes equation and the b part is the divergence constraint or of the gradient and we see that the P1, P1 discretization is actually not much cheaper than the P2, P1 discretization if we consider it in the right way. Um, because P2 is corresponding to P1 on a final level in terms of number of unknowns. So that is one thing that goes in there. And uh, the, the second is that then the P1, if, if you make the P2 so that it's equivalent to the P1, basically you shift the two by, by one level in the multigrid hierarchy, this P1 is somewhat cheaper to here, and that compensates almost uh, for the extra cost of, of the stabilization. Anyway, so this discretization one is uh, 
second order and the other one is first order in, in H1, in L2, one more. Um, so they are, in terms of work units, roughly equivalent, not here is it, it's quantified. And now we do the following. In that parameter space of multigrid, we choose for the particular problem the best that we can find by searching the complete parameter space. So kind of we try to find what would be the best textbook multigrid efficiency factor that we could find, and then we plot what accuracy we are getting relative to the best algorithm. So if you look, say, at, at this here, uh, here we are at four work units, and we see that the P1, P1 discretization reaches this accuracy, uh, slightly better than 10 to the minus 2, and for four work units, the P2, P1, as it should, reaches a better accuracy, uh, somewhat better than 10 to the minus 3 for a particular problem. And it's not noted here what the configurations of the algorithm really are, it just shows that for the same amount of work, the lower order discretization delivers somewhat less accuracy than the better one. Both have not yet achieved the asymptotic limit. The asymptotic limit for that discretization is that dotted line. If you want to get close to that, like out here, you have to spend more work units, like eight work units or maybe even 10. Uh, both, everything out here would be considered textbook efficient, right? So for the low order discretization, you can achieve the textbook efficiency uh, at, at latest with say work six work units. For the higher order, uh, that converges to the optimal limit somewhat slower. Uh, maybe you need eight or even 10 work units to get a satisfactory solution of the linear system. And, and you need to know the, which algorithm that was, which is also not trivial. But maybe the point that I wanted to make is that for the same amount of work, say a little bit above two work units, um, and this red curve is still much better than the blue curve. And uh, so the, the question whether you have solved the P2 elements with a lousy accuracy would deliver something like 10 to the 4, and then you have like 10 times as many error in it if you're here, is still better than if you spend the same amount of work uh, to solve for the low order discretization. I, I found that quite, quite interesting. Okay. Um, this is a part which for time reasons, I'm afraid that I'll have to skip because I'm a little bit behind and I want to have enough time uh, to talk about some things here. Yeah, I have only some 10 minutes, so I should go ahead with this and then talk about the course grids in multigrid. So, once you're on the courses grid and you cannot course anymore because your mesh hierarchy ends, what could you do? Uh, you could simply stop here and then use some other iterative method, method say for Stokes, Minres would work for uh, CG, for, for Poisson. You could say it's still a pretty large problem. For our extremely large problems, this courses grid actually has on the order of, of millions of unknowns. So it's not a trivial problem there. Uh, so it might be suitable to use an algebraic multigrid as a booster algebraic multigrid on the bottom to solve the million and then to kick it up to the trillion you use geometric multigrid. That is actually something that has been researched in the literature and works well. Uh, we have not done that. We have focused on using a sparse direct method because we have this nice collaboration with the MUMPS team uh, via Surfax. So we need to agglomerate the courses system to fewer processes. This is essential. So in principle, we can then also try to do the factorization, which is for the sparse direct solver, the expensive part, the LU factorization, which uh, requires an analysis phase and then the real factorization itself. Um, this could be done to be in, in parallel with the multigrid processing on the final grid. So you work on the factorization of the courses grid while multigrid traverses down the levels in the multigrid hierarchy. You can, of course, then exploit in good cases that the forward-backward substitution needs to be only be repeated once you have the factorization. And especially interesting mathematically is, of course, the modern low rank variance. And I can point to a webinar by Alfredo, uh, one of the key persons developing that uh, in a focus COE webinar, so on the neighboring uh, center of excellence uh, just a week from today. 
And then here are some papers if you want to learn about algebraic multigrid. Uh, this is a definite source by Jin Chao Chu and then Tsikatanov. And then this is the paper that's currently just under review uh, by uh, this group of authors for the multigrid side. The, uh, like Marcus Huber's PhD was developing good portions of the multigrid, and Philippe Lelou has been working on these coarse grid sparse direct solvers. So, uh, just briefly and then a little bit superficially, um, you have to convert this HHG matrix format, which is not a really matrix format because it's matrix free. First, extract the matrix, then you have to agglomerate to uh, the uh, master or so, so to, to fewer processes because the, the system is too, too, few, too big to solve trivially and uh, too small to solve on the full system. That that's how we should say it. It can be done in two ways, like this here in the master worker style or in what we call the Superman style, that you put dedicated processes out there for doing the sparse direct solver while the whole multi good business is run on another bigger part of the machine. Then you have to solve the course level problem by the uh, by mumps in this case, and then you have to redistribute back. I've listed this here to make it clear there is some overhead involved and the method has to be, the algorithm have to be good enough first uh, to, to compensate for that overhead basically. And that, that is just the table that shows this R is that compression factor. So uh, let, let's maybe go to the biggest problem with 33,000 uh, processes and there uh, the uh, compression factor. So the number of um, nodes that is being used for the sparse direct solver is a factor 192 less so that it's only 225 cores that you need for the core grid sparse direct solver and as, as you can see this is less uh, than, a, than a percent of the number of cores than, than that you have here so it is quite feasible to use that superman strategy and put these 225 cores separately and use them for nothing else than for the course grid solve. And uh, this story and other things uh, will next week be defended as the PhD thesis of Philippe Leroux. Uh, the defense will be February 3rd and uh, I'm very much looking to that because it contains these interesting results and many more. Okay, let me quickly check. Do I have time to spend a little bit about the Jura kinetic Poisson equation or am I already over time? Well, we, we're nearing the 55 minutes mark. If you want to take two Ooh, or three minutes. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'm then jumping ahead and just trying to summarize what I have here. Um, so, that, so that I can wrap up. Um, so this is about plasma physics and solving um, the geokinetic Poisson equation, which is written here in a geometry like this, which is a cross section of the tokamak. And we, we like these grid structures. So what we did is we've developed a very clever discretization for this kind of geometry. We have developed a multigrid solver for that. You see from the uh, smiley that uh, this still gives a raised eyebrow because we may have to think about that further. And uh, we are thinking about using GPUs, but that has not started. This is uh, work in progress. And um, bottom line, maybe uh, we, we have an order h to the four discretization, which is very clever, which uses um, a technique which is called energy functional extrapolation, which goes nicely hand in hand with multigrid. The idea was really to do that in a co-design effort, so discretization and solver developed at the same time with an eye immediately as another co-design aspect of which architectures we want to apply to uh, including GPUs. Okay, and, and here is the paper, since I don't have time to go into that. Uh, it, it's a set of two papers. Uh, which outline that. You see here an analysis, so the smoother in these geometries is, has to be specially constructed. Uh, I think we have done that in the right way. And 
you see here how this extrapolation technique is being built into the multi-grid algorithm. And that, that is the second paper that's coming up uh, to describe that. As uh, Julien has said, I've been over my time. Um, then as maybe um, some eye candy towards the end, um, the HHD software uh, has been used to solve real geophysics problems. And I'm just letting the video run briefly. So uh, this is the Earth mantle with imposed velocities on the Earth's surface from geometric, geophysical data. So the plate uh, movements of, of the Earth, uh, as, uh, the, the Earth's lithosphere imposed on the flow. And then here you see kind of a, a snapshot or a selected number of of a, uh, streamlines of the Earth mantle moving with velocities of a few centimeters per year. What you've just seen was below Africa, and this is below the Himalayas. And uh, in, if, if these co computations and the data are correct, actually the streamlines that have a converging flow and sink down under the Himalayas uh, would then go down to the Earth core and come up uh, below South Africa, where it is known that the upstream, the up velocity as a super plume lifts up the South African part of the continent uh, by almost a kilometer. So it is nice to see uh, that, that one can do these computations uh, with the geophysical data and doing some studies and uh, no time to talk about that. And uh, yeah, last thing, we can do that not with 10 to the 13 unknowns, but with 10 to the 12 unknowns. And that is sufficient to discretize the whole Earth mantle with a grid size of 1.7 kilometers. So this is a volume mesh. This is not like the, uh, for, for the thick shell of the Earth mantle, it is not like for the, uh, in, in uh, climate simulations or weather simulations where you only have this relatively thin layer of the atmosphere. Uh, we really essentially discretize the whole volume of the planet and we do get to a mesh that is not so far away anymore from one kilometer resolution, everything. Okay. Um, Thanks. So multigrid scales, we have these implementations and uh, we have that, it's still in progress to put that into a flexible, powerful software architecture that can support uh, modern discretizations. Sorry for being over time and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Uli. Uh, I know we are over time, but we'll still have a uh, few minutes for a couple of questions. So as I was saying in the introduction, if you want to ask a question, go under the participants table of the GoToWebinar interface and click on either ask a question at the interrogation point or the raised hand button. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Okay, uh, I'm opening the mic for Jordan Denev. Go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, I would like yes. to uh, ask uh, some question from the beginning. You said uh, you have tried on super MOOC or so, uh, some large scale computations or try to assess them. Uh, you mm -hmm. said it cannot be stored uh, when the matrix is 10 to the power of 13. And I would like to know which is the um, bottleneck. Is that the uh, RAM of the, of the computer or is that the hard disk, uh, which is the bottleneck uh, when you said that the matrix cannot be stored? Thank you. Oh, okay. So, th thanks for, 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 for the question. Um, so this is considering main memory, so RAM memory in, in that sense, uh, the distributed uh, collected memory. And on the current SuperMOOC NG, it is on the order of 700 terabytes. And that is only enough to store eight vectors of lengths 10 to the 13. Um, so in our most efficient multigrid implementation, we need three such vectors, one for the right-hand side, one for the solution, one auxiliary. 
Um, typically, if we do some conjugate gradients, we, we need some additional vectors so that uh, 10 to the 13, you cannot really go much bigger uh, alone from the vectors. And if you think of the matrix, so the matrix that we have has typically something like uh, 15 entries per row, in, in average higher order more, but the lowest order would be 15. So you would already uh, need something like, um, so one vector is 80 terabytes, you would have 15 times as much to store that matrix, just the numbers, but then you need also a sparse matrix structure. You need the pointers to the other elements and think about 10 to the 13, 32 bit integers are not enough to number them. So you need 64 bit integers so that e even that alone would double uh, in, in a naive implementation, uh, the, the memory requirements. So these are really extremely large problems where the matrix, I think for the 10 to the 13 and for our case, I've once calculated it, it goes up to uh, something on the order of, of 10 petabytes or so. And there's no machine in the world that has that much main memory. If you did store the matrix on the background disk, you would have the problem that you have to read it in all the time. And I have mm -hmm. not gone through the sort of computing the bandwidth requirements and what timing is that would, would eventually result in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, what do you mean by uh, a follow-up question? What do you mean by we have 15 vectors or so you said uh, your system has? something like this. Uh, is that uh, variables that you solve or equations or what is We that? are solving for 10 to the 13 unknowns. So 10 to the 13 degrees of freedom as largest. This is mm -hmm. the number of degrees of freedom that we're looking for and, and that we're solving. And then the 15 would be the number of elements that you have to 15 times as much that go into the stiffness matrix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, I saw that Herbert Owen wanted to ask a question. Herbert, I am opening your mic as well, but you'll need to do it on your end. Okay. Hello, Go ahead. Uli. Uh, a spectacular oh, talk. Hello, you you always leave me like very surprised, and the the amount of topics you touch for me is <laughs> impressive, impressive. So I I didn't know you were that much into finite elements, also lattice boltzmann and well everything. I don't know how you do it. I, I just touch a very small portion of what you touch. Uh, but well in any way uh, as you know i work with finite elements and well perhaps this is closer to me than what you do with uh, with lattice boltzmann and uh, you have preferred to go for, for lattice boltzmann for fluids but why couldn't we go with something like this so why have you preferred to 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 use lattice boltzmann for fluids instead of just this you have a Poisson equation a fractional set method P1, P1 is perfectly fine for me. Moreover, here we have an unstructured grid. From what I saw, you can use an unstructured grid. Uh, and for me, this is a, a huge advantage. Then inside each element, you subdivide internally. And this, I believe, is also a very good idea. I don't know if you can correct for the boundaries. If you have a core boundary, then you can adapt this, this mesh. Well, it's a lot of questions, but perhaps we can talk later at some moment but well i had a lot of curiosities <laughs> okay uh, I, I hope that we'll uh, be in contact at some point and if not in person then uh, why not using yeah. zoom for, for a, yeah. a, a meeting as part of the echo uh, project okay yeah. uh, but i i'm not sure that i can address everything uh, maybe julien no uh, just something <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe the most tricky question is why do we use lattice Boltzmann when we always also can do finite elements? Hmm. Uh, difficult to say. Uh, w when I got into lattice Boltzmann, I was very skeptical about the met method. And I must admit that it kept surprising me in, in the sense that lattice Boltzmann does have its advantages. Um, 
you know what, what we would now do here with time steps, as, as you see here on, on my last slide, this is the fine element computation, and it's, I, I think, 10,000 time steps uh, of the fine element solver with an implicit solve. Uh, if, if you did the same thing with let, Lettuce Boltzmann, you would need probably two orders of magnitude more time steps. On the other hand, it's an explicit method, and it's always, again, surprising how Lettuce Boltzmann outperforms implicit methods in some cases, not always. I'm not saying that that is always the best, but in some cases, it is really so amazingly fast that it can do a million time steps um, and, and just shrug your shoulders and then just compute it away. Um, but there are, of course, these problems where you benefit tremendously by doing implicit things and do finite elements and then all the uh, developed technology. Um, yeah, Herbert, we, we can do the things that you've said, but it comes at a price. It, it comes at the price that we have to do these co-design things. So uh, we, we cannot easily do that on, on top of existing software. Some things we can do on, on legacy code and, and other software, but what I've shown depends a lot on, on, on the fact that we have the luxury to develop that from scratch. And, and really kind of, I, I was lucky enough to know, uh, say, in, in year 2000 or 2005, when we started to develop this finite element things, I, I sort of had the vision that something like GPUs would be coming. And then that's why, why we are doing so well. But if, if you try to do the, the same that you are doing here, suppose you want to do LES, and the momentum you want to treat it explicit and this is what we typically do for, for the okay. momentum it's no big a deal if you have wall modeling then the only thing that you have implicit is 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 uh, the pressure uh, yeah you okay. can do some artificial compressibility uh, professor Wright loner is going this way he's doing some funny difference uh, with artificial compressibility and he says that this is very very competitive against uh, Lattice Boltzmann, and he prefers to go with the standard equations that are better known. Uh, well, I still have a lot of doubts, but well, I guess that perhaps we can talk at some other moment. Um, I, I tend to agree with you, right? So this, in these cases, uh, a well-designed finite element solver is, is, is state of the art, and, and it's uh, uh, not, a, not a bad thing. Uh, uh, to, to be critical of, of what I have shown, for a real industrial geometry, uh, the, the multigrid that I have shown would be quite difficult to use uh, because we need for the efficiency the structured refinement of an unstructured grid. So if the geometry is not too complicated, uh, the earth mantle is, is a good example of not too complicated, we are doing fine. If we have now an industrial geometry, uh, think of some mechanical structure. A car, or... yeah, for sure. Well, this is a good point, perhaps. Well, but yeah. you could do finite elements with some embedded mesh or whatever. Yeah, th th that would be a possibility, yes. But the world okay. is big, right? So there are many things that can be done, and there's, you know, I'm not, not saying that what, what we do is the only way to go. It, it is. So well, but you have the... like all of the technologies there. Yeah. That is why I like to ask to you because I only have finite elements. So if you tell me, well, <laughs> I can find it elements, but well, you have like kind of both things. One is for convection, but it could be adapted and it wouldn't be that yeah. difficult. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Again. Herbert, if, if you want, send me an email and we can try to set up a discussion because it's probably boring for, for the others if you go too much into yeah. detail. Here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. No problem, Herbert. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I saw that we had another question. Uh, Jose Fonseca, Jose, if you're still there, I'm opening your mic. Jose, are you there? Hi, okay, yeah, yes, I'm here. I'm just <laughs> writing to you, but yeah, I'm here. Can you hear? Yes, yes absolutely. I can hear. Uh, yeah, I just have a small question in, in, in the slide 25 where you do this comparison uh, with the different discretizations and how expensive they are uh, in terms of computational uh, 
their work. Um, I was just wondering if you, if you if you did some comparison with uh, or have some thoughts uh, how this would picture would like if you go for for discontinuous uh, pressure approximation, like um, something like p two minus p two p minus one. Um, I, I'm afraid that I cannot um, answer that in in a um, in, in in a good way. Uh, we, we we have thought about using modern discontinuous uh, discretizations anyway, DG methods or uh, derivatives of of that, but but we didn't have um, a, a chance to do anything serious on that. And um, from uh, with with a new uh, setup, so this high tech re implementation of of our old uh, HHG software. We should be able to do that, but until relatively recently, uh, kind of the uh, the continuous elements were hard coded in the software, and and it's only now that that we can start thinking about uh, using uh, discontinuous finite element spaces, non-conforming. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So sorry, I, it's definitely an interesting question, but I don't have an answer. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's okay, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to future uh, work and to see if there is an answer. <laughs> I was just wondering because if, for instance, the p minus one, p two p minus one is really cheap because uh, I mean you can just reuse the the node in the velocity node in the middle of the element to yeah. store the pressure there. And it's also stable, so you don't have this stabilization there. So I, I, I think it's it would be a it would be slightly cheaper than p1 p1, but still the velocity has a, a second order convergence. Okay, uh, it, it's a very good point. Yes, and uh, we we have thought of uh, using discontinuous pressure approximations on and off. So especially our collaborator in, in uh, numerical analysis, Barbara Wolmut of Munich, she she has been pushing in that direction, and but it, it was just not feasible with, with our our software. But I, I completely agree that these discretizations uh, need to be taken into account if if one, one really wants to move forward. Okay. So thanks, Annie. Thank yeah. you, Jose, for your question. Uh, I will move to what will probably be our last question today. Uh, Mr. Vadim Eisinger. Mr. Eisinger? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Vadim, okay. I can hear you. Yeah, great. Um, I have to admit, I haven't seen your talks for a couple of years, and I am just surprised of tremendous amount of progress in the short time, relatively short time. So one, I had actually two questions, but the first question was already answered with regard to the higher order discretizations, and I have another question. Uh, how difficult or what chances would be to extend this methodology to hyperbolic type of problem? Um, not... Um, so in, in principle, I think there, there's nothing uh, that would keep us uh, from from doing hyperbolic problems, in particular doing some kind of an explicit time stepping or or, or something like like that. Uh, if, you, you know, through through Harald and, and your project there, we, we do have some contact, so we, we could uh, sort of get together and, and think about that. Uh, what what I would like to mention about him, what could interest you. Um, what, what I didn't have time to talk about, uh, the earth mantle convection is, is determined by the uh, heat transport. And then for the most part, we have done this advection diffusion equation, very strongly advection dominated by, by a stabilized uh, finite element method. Uh, what Niels, the, the PhD student who works on that, has done very recently, he has replaced that with a Lagrangian method, basically a particle transport method. And that gives surprisingly good results. We are just writing that up. Um, pretty amazing. I, I um, cook so and, and also very well parallelized in our structures. So so really uh, seems to be a big winner to do it that way. 
Oh, right. that so, sounds so very good. Characteristics. We are following basically the characteristics for that. Okay, uh, that sounds very good, and that probably would be also not too difficult to transfer to other technologies that that we mm. have right now in the works. So we probably mm. should also have a an online appointment. Okay. Yeah. Thanks uh, a lot. Looking forward. Yeah. Thanks, Valim, for the question. Okay, uh, well, thank you all for the question. Uh, I think this will be the end of our webinar. As we've said before, uh, the session has been recorded, so I will upload it on the ECO YouTube channel shortly after we conclude. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your participation today and obviously uh, to extend a special thank you to Uli for this very interesting webinar. I know we haven't got the time to cover every topic you wanted to today, but I'm sure we'll, we'll leave an open slot for a follow-up webinar for you if you want to obviously. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks everybody for listening and, and your patience for me being over time. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye everyone. Thank you.